Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Film Forum at Home. My name is Joseph Berger, and I am the Theater Operations and Events Manager at Film Forum. I'm speaking to you all live from my living room in Prospect Lefferts Gardens. This is our fourth virtual event while the theater is temporarily closed. So first and foremost, we wish you all health and happiness at this time. We are very pleased to present on our virtual cinema platform, Helmut Newton, The Bad and the Beautiful, a new portrait of the prolific fashion photographer by acclaimed documentarian, Giro von Bohm. If you have yet to see the film, please consider renting it at filmforum.org. Half of that rental fee goes directly to Film Forum. I'd first like to welcome all of our high level members and supporters to our Zoom webinar. If at any point you have a question that you'd like to submit to our guests, please go ahead and click on the Q&A icon on your Zoom window. You can submit a question directly to our moderator, James. He'll try to integrate those questions into his conversation as best as he can, so please keep them succinct and relevant. I'd also like to welcome all of our visitors on our YouTube channel, Film Forum NYC. Please take a moment and subscribe. Okay, our guest moderator today is James Danziger, formerly a journalist for Vanity Fair and the Times of London. James is founder of the Danziger Gallery, one of the world's foremost photography venues since 1990. Exhibitions have included countless artists like Andy Warhol, Robert Frank, and of course, Helmut Newton. Hello, James, how are you? Hello, very good, thank you, and pleased to be here. Coming live from the south of France, we have our guest filmmaker tonight, Giro von Bohm. Giro is an award-winning German director and journalist who has made over 100 documentaries for European television networks, as well as the Sundance Channel. He has profiled numerous artists, photographers, intellectuals, and filmmakers, including Arthur Miller, David Hockney, Michael Haneke, Susan Sontag, and our third guest today, Isabella Rossellini. Hi, Giro. Hi, how are you? It's wonderful I'm, to be here. I'm very to well, and I'm, we're really happy to have you, and congratulations on the film. Finally, our very special guest, who needs no introduction, a friend of the film forum, Isabella Rossellini. Isabella is an actor, she's a filmmaker, she received an Independent Spirit Award for Best Female Lead for her unforgettable performance in David Lynch's Blue Velvet. She has frequently collaborated with Canadian director Guy Madden, including My Dad is 100 Years Old, an ode to her father, Roberto Rossellini, which Film Forum screened in 2014. She is also the co-director and star of the delightful series Green Porno, about the sexual behaviors of animals. She was one of Helmut Newton's subjects and is one of several film women interviewed in this film. Hi, Isabella. Hi, I'm delighted to be here and talk about Helmut. Thank you so much. Okay, so James, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And in about 45 minutes, I'll be back to say goodbye to all of you guys. Okay. okay. Have a great conversation, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Euro, first of all, I just want to say how much I enjoyed the film. Um, I knew Helmut Newton, uh, I worked with him, uh, and I have shown uh, his photographs on occasion, uh, and uh, I thought the film was very impressive uh, in all the different aspects of his life that it covered. Um, my first question is, uh, knowing how difficult it is to make documentaries, how did this one come about? Uh, it came about uh, actually through a friendship. I met Helmut Newton in 1997, quite late in his life in Paris uh, at a dinner. And we had fun together because next to him, uh, a, a blonde from uh, the Haute Volée of Paris sat and um, we both ridiculed a little bit about her with the eyes, you know, you can do that over the table. And uh, then we had lunch together and I visited him and June, his wife was very protective of him. Actually, Helmut belonged to her and she didn't want me to do a film about him. So it took another uh, three years um, until we could start this project. And uh, because I had to convince June most of all, and, you know, photographers don't like to be filmed uh, while they work, actually. 
uh, you have to seduce them. And it took me some years. But um, then I started simply uh, with a camera. I took the camera on long, I filmed myself on long walks through Berlin. He very often visited Berlin and told me stories about his youth, his upbringing in, in the wonderful Jewish grand bourgeoisie of Berlin. And um, that's how the things uh, came about, the film came about. So the, the, the footage of Helmut uh, that we mm -hmm. see throughout the film um, mo during his life, most of that was shot by you, the, the, the film of him towards the end of his life? Yes, I made a first um, documentary for television for Arte and ZDF in Germany and France um, in 2001. And uh, I had a lot of material left because it was a short television documentary. And I always thought I have to use this stuff. It's wonderful. And Helmut is so wonderful. And also I thought uh, really his pictures belong on the big screen on the silver screen. And uh, I proposed it and um, it took some years to get it funded and uh, now the film is there, as you know. And Isabella, um, you are also one of the stars of the film um, and Helmut had photographed you more than once. Uh, when did you first meet Helmut uh, and, and you know, how do you recall your relationship with him? I, I I don't, I don't remember, so I worked as a model extensively. I'm also an actress, but I also worked a lot as a model. And I don't remember if Helmut photographed me first, portraying me with uh, director David Lynch, because we've made the film Blue Velvet that became, was very controversial, but ultim ultimately successful. And then he photographed us, or if he had photographed me before as a model, and then I think I, I, think I knew Helmut and I told David that he could trust him. Because the fear, I mean, Helmut is very known and every model wanted to be photographed by the big photographers. But with Helmut, he was always a risk because his photos were, uh, he portrayed women in a way that it was difficult to, uh, <laughs> beautiful, you were beautiful. and But it was powerful, but there was a, an edge of cruelty to it. So a little bit of a matrix. So you never knew, there are a lot of nudity. And so you you never knew you know where you what was going to happen to you on the set. It wasn't a, a simple photo shoot where you just put on the clothes and you're trying to get the nicest pose so you can sell the shirt. He was not interested in that. He photographed way beyond the clothes that he, we were wearing. Yes. Well, I, I think one of the things that that you know is, is a theme in the film is how much of a provocateur uh, Helmut was. You know the the phrases used to describe him, uh, uh, you know, his favorite phrase was naughty boy, uh, but that, that was a gentle phrase for, I think, a lot of what he did. Um, and as you say, you know, uh, in the two pictures, uh, the two photo sessions of you that are included in the film, in one, you are uh, the head of a puppet in the hands of David Lynch, uh, and in the other, as you say, you are a high-class hooker, uh, but a Parisian high class hooker. Um, you know, how did you feel about those, you know, the way you were portrayed in those two shoots at the time? And how do you feel about those now? Well, you know, I mean, sometimes uh, when you play a role, uh, I feel like an actress and as a model, I have to, I play the role there. I'm, I'm landing my body. And so in a way, I'm, I was more comfortable in being the high class hooker. <laughs> He photographed me at my father's hotel because he always had to be a little twist at the Raphael Hotel Raphael in Paris. But um, but you know I'm I play a character because I've not been a hooker because I could make a living some some other ways. <laughs> and and uh, it's, it, it's always harder to be photographed uh, as a portrait of yourself because of course it's always more the idea of the photographer or who you are. And I think at the time whether Helmut had this idea of me or maybe I think it was the, I think it was the idea, the public idea it was that I was this uh, model that, that did the Lancome contract and you know this. And then in the hand of the great genius, David Lynch, I was molded uh, to express uh, um, a character, Dorothy Valance in Blue Velvet. 
who is probably abused, or she might be sadomasochistic, it's very complicated psychologically. But I think the, the belief was that David Lynch molded me and that I was took out of me uh, without me knowledge, uh, knowledgeable that performance. Uh, and I think that Helmut photographed that idea. So the photo was beautiful and uh, David is uh, looking at me as the muse that was flattering. But also there's this other aspect, you know, that uh, women are uh, incapable of, uh, especially when it comes to art or I things, they have to, uh, you know, have a man to get him out of them because they don't have it. <laughs> well, that, that, that was sort of my question was that, you know, in the, in the puppet picture, you know, you are not portrayed as an independent woman. Uh, and, you know, you've been photographed by, you know, many of the world's great photographers. Uh, you know, I sense a great warmth towards Helmut, uh, you know, from you in the film, but I was curious as to, you know, whether you like that picture or not. Well, you know, when you're posing, you do many different pictures, so you don't know which is the picture that ultimately uh, Helmut was going to publish, or the picture, I think we did it for Vanity Fair, in fact, I think, if I remember well, and so I don't know also if the editor, you know, you, you do many, many takes, and you make different position and different situations, and then one is get selected. So I don't know, I, I imagine it was Helmut's uh, uh, favorite because the photographer, they will not show the photos that they don't like. Yes. They'll give you three choices and that's it. And they like all of three of them. But I think I, uh, um, I did say, because David was at the beginning of his enormous success and he was hesitant, uh, you know, he didn't know how to be photographed. What do I do? And, uh, you know, and I said, oh, but Helmut is, is a very funny guy and you, you, you feel very comfortable. And that was true, you know, it was true also the first day if you play a hooker, and that's the great danger of working with anybody who's charming, whether it's David Lynch or Helmut Newton or Gareth Van Bowen. <laughs> Directors um, are, are, are seducible, <laughs> not in the sense that they jump in you and that, but they are, um, their brain is very seductive, and you want to take the trip in their brain, and you are in, an interpreter of their vision, at least I see myself as that. So I make myself available to, to whatever way they want to go. Otherwise, uh, they're not expressing me, they're expressing their ideas. That's how the, the way I see it. Mm -hmm. So, so Gero, when I was watching, yeah. the, when I was watching the film, uh, I was very impressed with how articulate and how comfortable um, all the people that you had who were talking about Helmet. Uh, and then when I looked at your filmography on IMDb, I saw that you had made films about most of them. So I felt like we were in some ways, you know, you had an ensemble cast uh, of friends and, and subjects. Um, you know, was that, is that something that, that you know, gave, made it easy? Gero? Mm -hmm. Have we lost Gero? <laughs> yeah. No, I well, you may uh, not hear it. Gero, can you hear us? I would say so. it's easier because you know that they will talk openly because they have confidence, you know. I can hear you, yes. Okay. I can hear you very well. Okay, so we're we're just getting your answer now about your ensemble cast. You can hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Of course, it made things easier because uh, uh, they all talked very openly um, about Helmut. But I wanted to add uh, something to what Isabella just said. Many of the models, they're not all in the film, the models I talked to said they were really grateful that they could play roles. It was not just clothes on their bodies or even naked, but they could play roles. Um, Claudia Schiffer says it definitely wasn't me um, uh, in those photographs, but um, I had the opportunity to play different women, different roles. And with other photographers, it, it wasn't like that. But I found that quite interesting. It was more about acting than about modeling in many cases. And uh, you must know that Helmut was a, a film buff, actually. He sometimes, the beginning of the story or the end of the story, and your fantasy builds the rest of the film. 
I think that was very important to him, um, to tell stories and not only to photograph something. Absolutely, but even as a, uh, you know, there is a beautiful quote from Diana Vreeland, uh, uh, that is this woman who, uh, you know, for a long time was uh, directed yeah. Vogue, uh, founded uh, the, at the museum of, at the Metropolitan Museum, the costume department, but she was kind of a high priest of fashion. And she did say, there is no beauty without emotion. And he said, even as a model, I knew that no good photographer has an idea of the perfect nose, the perfect eyes, the perfect mouth, that doesn't exist, is what you express. And so when you work with a photographer that photograph emotion, and of course there is a standard, but that's the agency. The agency is sort out through the crowd who are the girls that have, you know, blue eyes, blonde, whatever. So we already know that once you are a model, you belong to the standards. But what make a good model is the ability to express emotions. And a good mm. photographer, a superior photographer, captures emotions. So, Giro, among your ensemble cast was Susan Sontag, uh, who you made a film on. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, the Helmut is a controversial photographer. Uh, and he's certainly a, a controversial photographer in America. Um, and the difference between the American sensibility towards his kind of erotic photographs uh, and the European uh, perspective on it is very different. Um, but uh, Sontag had an interesting quote. She said, a lot of misogynistic men say they love women uh, <laughs> as she was filmed having a debate. And it reminded me of the uh, quote from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who said to this Congressman Yoho, just because you have a wife or just because you have a daughter, it doesn't make you a decent man. Um, and you know, the question, so, so the question of political correctness and, and what is now called a cancel culture, you know, is very much, uh, you know, an issue of the time, I think, you know, now more than ever. Uh, and I wonder, you know, how uh, we'll start with Giro and then and then also talk to Isabella, who who talks about feminism versus machismo in the film. Um, you know, do you feel that that issues of political correctness uh, have a place uh, in examining art? Um, they have a place because every viewpoint is important and we should listen to it. But I think um, it's a little bit too much now. Uh, we are in, in an age of uh, too much political correctness and um, it's dangerous for art because art has a lot to do with freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of images. And nobody is forced to look at images. Uh, nobody was ever forced to look at images of Helmut Newton. And of course, I understand Susan Sontag's viewpoint at the time. Uh, it, it was from an old TV show for, uh, from the 70s, Bernard Pivot's famous show, Apostrophe in, in Paris. And uh, she expressed something uh, many women, especially at the time and also now, uh, felt about those photographs. And, and we have to respect that. But I think it's very dangerous to say this shouldn't be shown, this should be censored. I'm afraid of, uh, of entering a new age of dictatorship of taste or something like that. I, should, I, I think everything should be visible, should be there in the museums, in books, in films. And um, I mean, one has to see the, the photographs, especially the nude photographs of Helmut Newton, uh, in the context of the time, the sexual revolution had just happened. Um, as Isabella says in the film, the nude body was no longer taboo. And um, all that had an influence um, on, on the photographs. I think it has nothing to do with the Me Too debate. Many women uh, in Helmut's photographs tell us, not me, so it has nothing to do with Me Too. But I even understand if somebody says it, it, it fosters a certain male glaze uh, or glare um, um, on the female body, but um, we shouldn't go too far with that. I'm, I'm afraid of too much political correctness, and that's true in Europe, meanwhile, as well as in the United States. There's not much of a difference anymore. 
Well, I think it's interesting, and and I think one sees this in the film that that Helmut could not be accused of Me Too. He he was his his love story, which is a, which is a part of the film that we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, was with his wife June, uh, and uh, you know, as much as he loved women, which he clearly did, uh, you know, he was he was not interested in trying to bed the women that he was photographing. Um, but I wondered, you know, Isabella, as someone who has a foot in, in the two cultures, the European culture and the American culture, uh, you know, how do you see, you know, how do you see that in relation to Helmut's work? And, and one of the things that I wanted to sort of bring up is that there, you know, I have shown some of Helmut's pictures uh, in group shows, but there is not a gallery in America that is representing Helmut's work, and there is not a museum in America that has shown his work. I'm shocked, really. No, I didn't I'm know shocked. that. But they show, but Robert Maperthorpe is shown, so why not Helmut Newton? I, I'm Newton asking the question. Is incredibly sexual, uh, a gay sexuality, but uh, also sadomasochism and images that are quite shocking. So it is strange that one is accepted and the other one isn't. Well, uh, I'll give you one explanation, which is that work that comes out of, of magazines, you know, commercial work or editorial work is very difficult to place in American museums unless, right. you know, it, it has, you know, stood the test of time. But, you know, but there is, you know, a, a very, very markedly different perspective uh, that Americans take towards, you know, Helmut's kind of work uh, and uh, and the work they do in Europe. Well, you know, I, so I agree with Garrow, you know, that is important at uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. I think that uh, Helmut, through his photograph, made me understood. Uh, um, I don't know that he was macho because it, was, it wasn't really machismo, but a certain image of a woman that he liked, that he liked, a woman that was beautiful and therefore dangerous and powerful toward him. And that made me understood a certain aspect of uh, machismo or of man dominance or man fearing of women. If I hadn't had uh, uh, him expressing it or, or, or Robert Maplethorpe showing shocking images of sex uh, among uh, uh, gay people and, and sadomasochistic images, but he photographed them like beautiful. Sometimes he took me like, oh my God, what a beautiful abstract shape. Oh no, it's a behind, then I would say. So that he, un he made me understood the aesthetic, the beauty. So artists help you uh, understand further that what you can understand with your brain. But I have to say that something about Helmut and, and Gera would know better. Uh, there was always, I mean, to me, it was always uh, intriguing that Helmut was Jewish, grew up during Nazism, and the women he photographed, be besides uh, some black models, but mostly were white, uh, Aryan, and it could have been the version of Lenny Riefenstahl, but feminine. It was almost like a little boy who had dreamed of the Aryan race as he was growing up, and he could never belong because he was Jewish, and he was, and eventually they were going to be you know, persecuted and killed, but that is from the eye of a little boy. And I always saw that, and he was very touching inside uh, through, a, through a German mentality to me, you mm -hmm. know, because I saw this longing and this not belonging, and, and then he expressed himself in a different way once Nazis was defeated. But I sensed that, and it was important to me to understand it. I mean, Italy, after all, was a, a, had Mussolini, uh, a lot of people liked him. There is no dictator that can stay a dictator if he doesn't have a certain amount of support of the population. Um, so it's important to me, if you repress that voice, you wouldn't understand it, even if you want to oppose it. You have to listen. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting Absolutely. parallel um, yeah. with Slim Aarons, you know, who photographed the, you know, the, the Ote Wasp life of America. Uh, and there was a recent, documentary about him and it turns out that although he did not publicize it in any way he was Jewish yeah. and so we have these two Jewish mm -hmm. photographers who photographed you know the the, the blonde you know their, their favorite subjects were were, were blonde and well off uh, and in fact, I, I don't think I worked so much with Helmut I mean we we liked each other and we worked because I was 
we were giggling and I was available, but I wasn't his type because I was too Latin, I think. I was too Italian, although half of me is Swedish that he could deal with, but the other part was too warm. <laughs> he wanted a cold, uh, domineering woman. Right. Um, so we have a question. Well, he, he, may I say that Helmut talked about this influence Isabella just mentioned very openly. He said, you know, I was 13 when Hitler came to power. And uh, once all of a sudden you were surrounded with those images, with Aryan images and with this Nazi propaganda, which was terrible. But if you were a boy and uh, nothing, uh, you have nothing in your mind than, um, uh, let's say, girls and pictures, um, of course it influences you. And it influenced him up to the very end. The play of shadows, even in the late photos, um, absolutely. It, it was an important influence. And by the way, he was quite friendly with Leni Riefenstahl at, at the end of their lives. They wrote each other letters, mm -hmm. quite tender letters even. And he, and he photographed her and his, yeah. his picture of her is in your film. Um, right. We do have a question from one of the viewers, which I'm going to pose to both of you in different ways. Um, to, to Isabella as a subject and to Giro as a filmmaker, uh, the question is, does the camera lie? No, the camera doesn't lie, but I think there is a common denominator that belong to all of us. And we're trying to reach that common denominator of human being. When I played Dorothy Valance in Blue Velvet, I play a sadomasochistic, probably somebody affected by the Stockholm syndrome, a woman that was raped, and was very, I never had this experience in my life, but uh, that severe, but I could anchor the character to some of my experience and find it in me. Uh, and so I gave, uh, I gave a voice uh, to something that wasn't mine. It's a portrait of something. And I hoped uh, for the women that did have the experience that Dorothy Valance went through, that I could give voice in the fictional form. Uh, so it is anchored to me. It is my crying. It is my screams. It is my pain that I'm showing because you concentrate as an actress until you feel pain or, or laughter. But the story may not be literally mine. And Giro, does, that, does the camera lie in your world? The camera doesn't lie, but the camera cannot capture truth in any way. Every, when the camera is rolling, everything is different. So even, can you capture reality? Not really. I mean, it's limited, I would say. Even the fly on the wall, if there is a fly on the wall, things are different. And um, you edit films, so that falsifies reality. And um, I don't think it exists. The camera doesn't lie, but it has... It is very limited what, in terms of reality or even truth. One of the things which I liked about this film, and there are many things I liked about it, but it's a, essentially a 90 minute film and it keeps moving. And there's story after story, there's sort of a progression. Not only do we go through Helmut's life, we hear the stories that different people have to tell. Uh, and then one of the stories which, which the film has is the love story. Uh, of of Helmut and June. Um, can you talk a little bit about that story and, and how well did you know June, who was always considered a famously difficult person? <laughs> I didn't find her that difficult. You, you had to be strong because she was strong. And as I said, I had to convince her for some years uh, so that I could do that film because she had filmed Helmut in... in uh, and his work many times. She was always present at the shootings. She was organizing everything. Actually, she ran the set. She had more authority, as uh, Isabella, from her experience, uh, says in the film, more authority than Helmut. He was the little boy playing with his toys. Uh, but, of course, there was much more about it. Um, uh, it was a real love um, and, uh, I mean, they had their fights, of course, because uh, June was really powerful and, and Helmut was not always easy. Um, a, a huge love story for 56 years. And um, I think it was 
unique because they work together so closely. Um, um, uh, June curated all his ex or most of his exhibitions and books, and they were talking day and night about photography, and they had a lot of fun together. They both love to laugh. Uh, but it's not, it, there was another love story in, in the film. It's very discreet, it's with Hannah Shigula. That was a real love story uh, Helmut had with this Fassbinder star, Hannah Shigula in Berlin. Um, they met each other several times, and Hannah says, uh, uh, when all three of us um, were at La Coupole in Paris, we had fun together, and she doesn't go further into that. Um, but between the lines, you can read that there were some other women in Helmut's life. But uh, why should we talk about it too much? And, and it's, I mean, my film is not an investigating TV documentary. It's a film which leaves things open to fantasy, I hope. Well, it was very discreet, and I actually had that question for you because she is quoted as saying in the film when she talks about her relationship with Helmut and with June, we were three. And mm -hmm. I was going to ask you whether that, you know, wh whether one read into that what I thought perhaps one was supposed to read into that. June was always present <laughs> in all of Helmut's uh, uh, relations, working relations, private relations. June was always there. That's why there was no real danger ever. But he loved to play. Yeah. He was a very playful guy. When you made this film, how many, you know, whose permissions did you have to get? I, and can you explain the relationship that, that there is now between his work, June, and the Newton Foundation? Uh, the Helmut Newton Foundation was very important, crucial, of course, and they opened up their whole archive. I could use hundreds and thousands of photographs, and you can imagine, James, how difficult it was uh, to, to make the choice. But they were very, very generous. And otherwise, I couldn't have done it because it would have been too expensive also. Um, but we had an arrangement. They are co-producers of the film. Um, so I could do it. And um, uh, June um, uh, gave us all her footage she shot during Helmut's lifetime. Footage of shootings, footage of private situations, immensely generous. And, and I'm very grateful for this kind of, of confidence. Um, so one of, the, one of the people who, who talks very effusively in the film, who I'm, I, I realize you both know, is Anna Winter. Um, you did a wonderful job of getting her to sparkle. Uh, Isabella, were you, did you enjoy Anna Winter's uh, part in the film? I did. I, I've always wondered if Anna uh, liked Helmut Newton uh, photographed because uh, I think he was like playing with fire, you know, and <laughs> he was responsible at Vogue to keep it, you know. But on the other hand, you also need some spices. Otherwise, if the magazine is too predictable, then you lose your, your audience. And I have to say that uh, uh, now that there is, uh, we get uh, most of our news uh, virtual, and I, I do miss uh, uh, the waiting uh, for the magazines, uh, you know, for us in that world of photography and fashion, uh, waiting for, especially for Vogue, because they work with such revere uh, photographer. And not only the photo, but the quality of the paper, the surprise of turning the paper and seeing the layout, all an art that is a bit lost now when you see Vogue online. I don't feel you have the same uh, um, curated to perfection as it is a magazine, which is a little work of art on itself. And I kept some magazines uh, uh, just uh, forever, just because they were like beautiful illustrated books, you know, where every page is a surprise and unexpected. So Anna knew what she was doing, but I'm sure she had to also tremble every time she worked with Helmut, well, especially having, uh, having to deal with an American audience who sometimes is incredibly more open than Europe. Uh, for example, as we come, to, as I made the example with Robert Mapethorpe, and sometimes is incredibly closed and puritanical and calls for censorship and political correctness. 
Right. Well, you know, the, she, you know, she says in the film, uh, sometimes you need a stopper. Uh, <laughs> but, but there was the, the, the case which was talked about when the Nadia Auerman was photographed as a disabled person. I wonder, you know, are there, are there stories, you know, pictures that he did that for either of you crossed the line where you felt, you know, I mean, not, not every picture that every artist takes, you know, has to be has to be great or, you know, you don't have to approve of every picture. Are there are there cases where either of you felt that he crossed the line in terms of your own personal taste? Right. I mean, not not Helmut, you know, besides the fact that I would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not we women. We're not like that. That's your fantasy. Besides that comment. Um, no, but Robert Mapplethorpe, I have to say that when I first see his photos uh, were shocking. And and yet uh, there was a part of me that says, you know, is there some, because I, I thought of them, you know, and it wasn't like looking at pornography. So there was something else. Uh, and and I think the Patti Smith book helped me immensely uh, to understand that world, uh, that world of uh, really bohem and artists and artists refusing every rule so that they live everything to reestablish what they like and what they don't like. They don't want to be told you can't do this. They want to first taste it and say, okay, that hurts. I wouldn't do it, but they want to do it first. And, uh, and yes, I thought that the Patti Smith uh, opened up for me a whole world and also understanding and accepting, uh, uh, Robert Mapplethorpe and not being shocked and frightened. Dira, are there pictures of helmets that for you didn't work for you or crossed a line for you or did you do you feel everything is game? Don't know. There are very there are pictures, there are very few pictures I must say. Intentionally I included some in my film. There is this photograph of a, a blonde guy, um, you have a feeling he's raping a girl on a desk and the guy looks like Donald Trump. So there's a double trouble for me. Um, and I, I don't like this picture, uh, especially when there's another one um, where Aya Teurila, a wonderful model, he photographed her uh, on the backseat of a Rolls Royce once at night, beautiful. And there's another one with her where she's beating up another girl. Um, yes, you know that. Not really yeah. crossing the line, but very close to the line. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Isabella, if you feel the same about. Those. The same. There are some uh, yes, which uh, I don't especially like, but few. Yes, sometimes, especially I think with me, when it comes to violence and hurting somebody, mm -hmm. um, that becomes uh, maybe a thing that I. I, I feel do we have to get we have to go there and, and explore that mm -hmm. or do we just mm -hmm. say do not hurt you know mm -hmm. even I mean of course they were acting and they were not hurting uh, but it's it's hard to know I mean it's hard to know you know I don't I see okay I was married to Martin Scorsese and one day Marty was arguing that he does films that there is violence in his film because there is violence in society and his film portrayed the violence. And my brother-in-law works with the police department and he said, well, yes, Marty, but in America we had advertisement and in 30 seconds we, can, we know we can influence the audience. How can you not think that a film that is two hours long doesn't influence? Both arguments are valid, you know, and we don't have an answer. And I think that European are better at living with the ambiguity, the non-answer, the gray, than the Americans that want everything a little bit more categorized as good, bad, black and white. And that's why maybe uh, uh, Helmut's photos are in museums uh, in Europe, but they are not represented yet in museum is America because he always worked in between the fashion, but also at the edge of it. Mm -hmm. And the ambiguity is not liked in America. It's interesting uh, that you say that. This is one purpose of the film, maybe, you know, to, to show his universe and it's up to everybody to judge, to like it or not like it. Yeah. And yeah. you helped, Isabella, with your wonderful uh, explanations and analysis uh, in the film. Your statement is so precious. Oh, thank you, Carol. <laughs> I, I think that Isabella makes an interesting point 
which is that the work of Robert Maplethorpe has been easily accepted into American institutions and cultural life, whereas the work of Helmut Newton hasn't. And it's also one of those things that I think, you know, one, one part of the analysis is the American versus the European. You know, Helmut, Helmut had a European sensibility and Robert Maplethorpe, regardless of how you know, shocking the work may or may not have been, had an American sensibility. So, you know, the, the, we're still we're still more than an ocean apart. <laughs> um, but sure. but taking a, a a ninety degree turn from these serious things, uh, one of the things that, that that I have to say about the film is it has great humor, uh, and there are there are a lot of humorous scenes in it. And I wondered if if either of you could talk about some of the scenes that you enjoyed the most that were the humorous scenes in the in the film. Well, for me, I mean, I speak for Gero, his, his film will talk, but to me, um, Gero's film captured the, the, boy, the boy in, in Helmut, that it was what made us want to work with him. He was a great photographer, but, and we went with hesitation to his set saying, oh, what is he going to make us do? But then with his humor and his childlike, it was like playing, uh, playing with a naughty boy. And then maybe June will come and say, oh, mama is here, mama is here, let's behave. But you know, it was a little bit like that. But it was an innocence. And I think Gero's film captured that. And, and I think it's a quality that a lot of artists need to have in order for the others to be available for their work, for a model, an actress. Often uh, photographers, directors, there is a, an innocence and a playfulness about them. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to show that, exactly. For instance, this once my favorite scene is Helmut lying on a sofa in the Chateau Marmont um, in Los Angeles, and the phone call comes in, and he first says, "Oh, get her number, get her number." We call her back, but it's too late. He has the phone in his hand, and uh, then there is a little conversation back and forth. I'm in the middle of a meeting. You have to be fast. But he's lying there half naked with a sleeping mask on his head. And yeah. that be exactly. Uh, things like that. Or he he comes to the camera very close and after a shooting says, another $10,000. <laughs> I can buy more diamonds for my Junie. Yes. <laughs> things like that. And, and, um, and, and Grace Jones um, uh, talks about uh, working with Helmut and, and she laughs hard <laughs> when she tells those stories. Um, well, the theme of naughty boy keeps coming mm. up throughout the film. Uh, and there was one surprising scene where when you're talking to Anna Winter, she pulls out a fax that Helmut had sent her. And, you know, first of all, how, how many years has it been since any of us have received a fax? Uh, and, and, you know, the fact that she had kept these faxes, I thought was very interesting. But also he signs the fax, your favorite naughty boy. Yeah. And and he says I'm I'm waiting for the reader's letters. That was the uh, the chicken with the high heels photo. Uh, I'm waiting for the uh, for the reader's letters. Uh, the more the more en the more enemy the more honor as Kaiser Wilhelm II said. He's quoting Kaiser Wilhelm in that fact. Your favorite old naughty boy helmet. I mean, it was very playful at the time. I think times have changed. Um, um, uh, my daughter Julia is working in the industry, and I think it's less playful now, according to what she tells me. It's wonderful. It's still fascinating, but it's less play, less light. Let's say. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, time. The, we times were have... smaller before, and now it's a big industry with a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I always liked being a model more than being an actress because the, there was a lightness in the fashion world. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's once it became a big industry like the film industry and working with the studio, you have a little bit the weight of the world on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. take away some yeah. of the fun. <laughs> yes, well, the times have very much changed. Uh, my daughter was the events coordinator at the Chateau Marmont until oh, uh, and you know that is you know th there are two characters in the film that are that are not people. One is Berlin, and one is the Chateau Marmont. Definitely. You get to stay at the Chateau Giro. True. Yeah. 
Yes, of course. We all stay oh, yes. there. I live there for Many three times. I love it. Yeah. 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 So, Wonderful. And Helmut loved it. But there was just one place in the world he loved more. He didn't like Monte Carlo very much, which is no wonder, I think. It's, it's not the most pleasant place. But he loved Berlin. And I thought it was a, a great gesture of someone who had been chased out of Germany under brutal circumstances to come back and, and say, this is my hometown. Um, funny enough, he's, we always spoke English in Berlin and always German in LA. <laughs> so there still was a little distance, of course, uh, expressed by the language, I think. Um, but he loved Berlin. It, it was his world, his universe. It had marked on him considerably. And he came back all the time and, and wandered around. And he showed me at the Bahnhof Zoo, in the Zoo station, he showed me the, uh, the track from where he had left in 1938 to catch a ship uh, to China. And um, the last building he saw from the train was the Landwehr Casino. A soldier's casino um, uh, in Berlin, and now it's the Helmut Newton Foundation in this very building. Amazing circus history makes. Yes. And I haven't been there, but I hope to go there. Well, I, I, have two, I have two Helmut Newton stories to share that both happened when he was uh, photographing Monte Carlo for a story for Vanity Fair. And, uh, and we were at the Beach Club at, at, in Monte Carlo, and I saw two very attractive girls who were lying down topless. <laughs> and I ran to get Helmut uh, and I said, Helmut, you know, you'll want to photograph these girls. And we come back to where the girls were and they put their tops on. And Helmut comes up to them and he goes, girls, tops off. And they immediately <laughs> respond, they immediately did what he told them to do. Uh, the yeah. other story is that we were photographing, you know, people who summered in Monte Carlo, and and two of the people were the Niederlanders, the you know the famous theater owner and his wife, and they were staying at the Hotel de Paris, and Helmut and I are waiting in the in the lobby downstairs, and a call comes down to us: send the photographer up. Helmut's face turns to one of fury to be the photographer, not Helmut Newton. So we go up to the room and Mrs. Niederlander is standing by the side of the bed, just finishing a phone call. And Helmut goes, no, I love that. Put your husband next to you. And he puts them up against the wall and he pushes them further and further back. So they're like insects pinned to the wall. And that's the picture he took of the Niederlanders. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call him the photographer. Um, anyway, I see that we are getting towards the end of our time. So I wanted to ask both of you uh, and Isabella, thank you for staying. Uh, we were told originally you were going to be with us for 20 minutes, but I'm happy you stayed for the whole yeah. time. Thank uh, you so, so much. Thank so, you. So starting with you, Isabella, so can you tell some of the people who are watching um, what some of the projects you're working on that we will have to look forward to over the next year or so? Well, of course, you know, as an actress, all my work has been canceled, as well as modeling. Uh, so I was uh, doing, I did complete the filming of a BBC series called Domina in Italy, uh, but uh, I was able to do the post-production sound at my house, having a technician coming with mask and everything and use my house. We put all the bed mattresses around me to create a sound studio, and I was able to do some of the dubbing. I was supposed to do an HBO series on Julia Child that was going to play Julia Child's best friend, Simka, French, who taught her how to cook when she was in France. But they, I haven't yet done my scene and the moment, for the moment it is suspended. All my tour, you know, I write monologues and I tour them in the theater. And for the moment, the first booking that I have uh, potential is March, 2021. So all actors, all but dancers, all performers, Right now, we're not doing anything. I did get a, a little grant from the Onassis Foundation and I made two short films from home of, me, of uh, uh, Darwin's ghost coming to talk to me. And I'm hoping to make maybe a, a, a series. So I, I have these two pilot and the Onassis Foundation uh, gave me some money to create and I'm fishing around to see if there is anybody who would want to uh, give me some money to make a series. Well, I think, can you also tell people a little bit about your other profession, which is a farmer? 
Oh, farmer, of course. Well, I, you know, I, I, well, we, uh, we, 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 James and I have a house uh, uh, in the, in Long Island, and uh, I have started uh, about six years ago an organic farm, and I, uh, I, I have lots of people working with it. It's almost like I'm in. I have 28 acres and I rent pieces of it, choosing people that would like to use the farm as a lab uh, for their creativity. The last person is uh, Brian Anderson, who works in photography, but he really would like to become a landscaper. Does he have a green thumb? The answer is yes. He has been creating incredible flowers. One by Patty Gentry, who had been a chef for 25 years, but really wanted to be in agriculture and she started and she does now the most beautiful vegetables that we sell in the CSA, we sell shares. And I've always been interested in animals and all, most of my monologues are about animals because I studied animal behavior and all that. So I have a collection of heritage breed of chickens. Now I'm working with Parsons School of Design uh, and I have nine sheep, different breeds of sheep so the student can feel the different wool on the animal before it's been cut out and how to process it. Um, so it, it has been a lab of creativity, uh, agriculture, and art. That's how I see my local farm here. I, I, I always think of you as keeping busy. I'm always busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Gira, what do we have to look forward to from you? Um, first of all, uh, I love gardening. I, maybe I have a green thumb together with my wife. We have a big garden and a vineyard in the south of France. So I'm taking care of that because Isabella is a little bit of our role model, always in many respects, by the way. And um, I'm working on a television series. Uh, there, there are already six films just finished before the lockdown about UNESCO World Heritage on all continents. And this will continue. Nobody knows when, because now you can't travel. And um, I'm working on a new documentary for the cinema about uh, someone else from the fashion world. Uh, unfortunately, I signed a contract and cannot say who. Uh, he was a designer, but not only a designer. He also took photos and uh, was an oh, incredible uh, uh, unique uh, character. Oh, I cannot say the name, but this would be my next project for the cinema. Project. We, we would not expect that Berlin would have anything to do with that. Or just... <laughs> <laughs> it's rather Paris. Yeah. And, and are some of the films that you've made and the, the illustrious people that you've made films about, including Isabe Isabella, available for people in America to see uh, online? Um, unfortunately, no, YouTube. YouTube, if you punch in my name, you, you will find many films. Yes, absolutely. Also portraits. Yes. But YouTube is the only way to get them, I think, for now. After we after we did so much to have big screen and quality. I know we have, that's the next battle. <laughs> I think quality. so, yeah. Quality is gone, yeah. We will fight it together, Isabella <laughs> and James. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure, you know, in this difficult time, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that, that we have all been able to enjoy are first of all, Zoom calls, uh, and secondly, all the things that are available to us through streaming. So, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it, it widens, you know, while, while, it, while it narrows the world, it also widens the world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think we're now joined by Joseph again. Uh, and thank you. It's nice to see you both. However, I'd like to say that I've been in operations and events for 20 years, and I cannot wait to get back into an actual room yeah. with actual people and sit across from our special guests rather than uh, across the, the, the planet. But like you said, we're, we're doing our best, I think, in these strange times. And James, I would love to hear what you have planned or how you're approaching this strange moment that we're in with your gallery closed as well. Yes, well, m my favorite quote to live by is Rahm Emanuel's quote, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, you know, I see this as a time for reinvention. Um, we have been putting up uh, virtual viewing rooms uh, every two weeks. You know, normally we do shows for six weeks, but we've been putting up shows every two weeks uh, on DanzigerGallery.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and pre-COVID, 
uh, I was looking at opening up a second space in Los Angeles. Um, and I am actually, of all the places to go to next week, I am going to Los Angeles because I have two options. One is to open a space, uh, you know, when, when things cool down a little bit. Uh, but I also have a number of gallerists who are interested in, in doing joint ventures with me. So I'm going to decide which one, but I, you know, to me, uh, Los Angeles is a very exciting, uh, like, like it was for Helmut Newton, Los Angeles is a very exciting place for me. Um, my, my parents lived there when they were older and so I'm quite familiar with it. Uh, so my hope is that in the, in the new world, uh, that, that opens up, uh, I will be living this kind of bi-coastal life and, and very much look forward to engaging with the, with the West Coast world as well as the East Coast world. Well, the great thing about all of this virtual work that we're doing is that it, it can continue and extend you know, beyond once we're back to some sort of normal world. So having, having your galleries go online and all of this work we're doing here, I think, um, will will pay off in the long run. And Joseph, for people who enjoyed this talk, hopefully, uh, is there is, does this stay up on YouTube? Can we send a link to people? Absolutely, I'm going to re I'm going to re edit this slightly, and then I'll repost it on YouTube, and it will be available at our YouTube channel, Film Forum NYC. Oh, are you going to edit out all the dirt, the naked women <laughs> and gay guys? <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought everything was fabulous. <laughs> You're, you think, is there anything you would edit out? We'll just edit out that very awkward pause at the very top. <laughs> and, and then we'll just get right, we'll get right to the good stuff. Um, so before I sign off on all of you guys, I just have a few things to say to everyone out there. Um, I encourage all of you, of course, to go to our website, filmforum.org and rent Garrow's film, Helmut Newton, The Bad and the Beautiful. I'd like to thank everyone at Kino Lorber, especially David Nin and Nick Kemp, and everyone on the Film Forum staff who helped me put this event together today, especially our director, Karen Cooper. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to Film Forum's COVID-19 emergency fund. Help us reopen our doors in the hopefully very near future. You can do so by going to filmforum.org backslash support. Finally, please stay connected to us via our email newsletter and our social media handle Film Forum NYC at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We will keep you all up to date with additions to our virtual cinema roster and any upcoming virtual events. We've got a few great events coming up. So I think that's it. Thank you all so much. This was really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and bravo, Gero. Thank bravo. You. That was marvelous. Thank, thank you. you, Isabella. Thank you, James. And thank you. Sure. Giro, I look, look Isabella, I look forward to seeing you in the village. And Giro, I look forward to meeting you when our paths cross. And, and I'd love forward to. to you, yeah. And I'd love to see all of you at Film Forum very soon. Oh, we, we, oh, we love it. We all go there. I've yeah. been there so many times. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.